Phil Sutherland from Team Type 1. Phil, of course, uh, grew up here in Tallahassee. He lives up in Atlanta right now. But uh, Phil put a, a, a very interesting group together, Team Type 1, and I'll let him take it away. So, pretty cool what these guys have, the new technology that's come out. Um, thank you all for coming and having me back home. It's kind of it's great to get to come back to Tallahassee and do this versus being all over the world in a hotel room. I can say, come home with your mom. Um, so, thank you for coming out, especially to the gun show. That's <laughs> true. People with diabetes can have big bumpers too. Unless there's a big guy behind me, I'm not the best example of that one. Yeah. And so I'm here today to tell you a little bit of a little story uh, about myself, my life with diabetes, and you know, how it almost didn't happen. You know, at seven months of age, I'd lost 10 pounds in two days. My mom was persistently, and she took me to the hospital. And in the ER, my later the diabetes educator saw my free breath. So they ended up testing some diabetes, and sure enough, they came back an hour later and said, man, we got good news, we got bad news. The good news is, you brought your son in one hour later, he'd be dead. The bad news is, your son's got doing all that he needs, and based on current technology, if he lives at 25, he'll most likely have renal failure to be alive. And I know I might look 16 years old, but I'm actually 25. <laughs> my eyes still work, my kidneys still work, and I, along with seven other people with diabetes, just race our bikes across the country and world record time. saw a cool piece of technology and some of the innovation that's come out in the diabetes world. You're probably sitting here asking, why am I holding a diaper in front of you? Uh, I'm not bringing you any good news from Atlanta. I'm not like it. This is, this is blood sugar checking 25 years ago. When my mom got on and did some research and found out that you check your blood sugar, you do your shots, you exercise, eat right, those complications don't have to happen. And so, times a day she would squeeze the urine out of my diaper on a test strip to find out where my blood sugar was in the past couple hours. This is how it was done for the first couple years of my life. We didn't have the freestyle flash, freestyle light meter, which takes five seconds to get a stream of accurate result. You have this. And I wouldn't want to be the parent that had to squeeze my child's diaper. And change them is bad enough, but squeeze them something else. So she did that. She found out, check your blood sugar, and take care of yourself, it's going to be all right. But it wasn't her disease to control, it was mine. And so at some point, she had to transfer these lessons over to me. And six years old, I was at a birthday party, and it was time for cake. And so I went up to my mom, and I said, Mom, can I have some cake? Like any kid with diabetes probably ever said. And has anyone ever said, I don't want my shot? Anybody? <laughs> anyone with diabetes has ever said at one point in life, I don't want my shot. My mom said, try to use some scare tactics. That's fine, you're blind. <laughs> <laughs> don't do your shot, don't take care of yourself, don't do the tool you have, you'll be blind at 22. I said, Can I have my shot? <laughs> she goes, No, you don't want to take care of yourself. You don't want to use the tool that you have to manage this disease. Go live a carefree for play, you'll be blind by the time you go graduate college. Well, joke's on her. To, 23 before I was going to graduate college. <laughs> so I begged and I begged and I begged, persistent like she was, and I got my shot. I went out of the cake, and for the remaining 19 years of my life, I've lived a very normal, I say above normal life with diabetes. At six years old, I learned the most important lesson I think I will ever learn in life is use the tools that you have, be excited about them, and life's going to be okay. So I'm not going to sit here and Lie and say there's never been a challenge with diabetes. Does anyone have a high blood sugar or low blood sugar freaks you out? Has that ever happened? Mm -hmm. Nine years old was Christmas. I had the flu. Back then, insulin took a long time to work and lasted a lot longer. And so you had to be cautious when things like that were happening. So sure enough, I get the flu, and instead of getting to wake up early in the morning and go see, go open my presents, I had to go to the hospital. And so I spent the entire day in the hospital on Christmas when I was nine years old. Larry, did you come to see me that day? So I, I, I got to bring him in. Merry Christmas here, right here. So I get home that day after everything's taken care of, and my brother, who's been waiting 365 and a half days for Christmas, <laughs> waited till I got home that afternoon to open presents. 
Okay, so it's you get to find out who your friends are and how many people <laughs> care when, when the tough times happen. They're, they're going to happen. You know, it's from experiences like that in low blood shows. In high school, Shill and got to take care of me. This is my speech teacher from high school. <laughs> and one of my best friend's mothers. We've known each other for years. But other than the fact that I drank Diet Coke, you know, in 13 years of schooling, no one would have known that I had diabetes. We did all the same things, did everything that everyone else did. But one time, something was a little different. They called me Rhonda. For a few minutes, I'd say about 10 minutes, I was dead silent. The instructions in the class I was in were type your ABCs on the computer screen. And I was typing one, two, three. I just couldn't get it straight. So I walked to the next class by myself, dead silent. And Sheila will vouch for me that if I'm quiet, Leslie, if I'm quiet for one, two seconds, something's got to be wrong. <laughs> So I get to the next class, and Jane Durbin said, there with the Washington Dollar Bar on her desk. My blood sugar's low, so I can't think to say, hey, Jane, my blood sugar's low, I need this. So I said, Washington Dollar. <laughs> no, Phil, you're a mooch. You always ask for my food. <laughs> you know, you're not getting it this time. Washington Dollar. <laughs> Phil, you're a mooch. You always ask for my food. Plus, you're a diabetic. You can't eat this stuff. Oh, yeah. I'm sitting there. Okay, what's your it was all I made it out, and I passed out in class. So that, that could have been a very, very bad time. But I listened, I listened to my mother, I listened to my doctors, you know, both of my doctors and growing up are here, Nancy and Larry D. I told all my friends what to do if something happened. I told my teacher what to do if something happened. So my friends ran across the street and got some orange juice and sugar, brought it back. By the time the paramedics came, got in, I was A-OK. -okay. They, my friends have taken care of me. And that's, if there's one takeaway that kids that I'd like to give them this is, tell your friends what to do. I would always tell mine, if I start acting any dumber than I normally act, <laughs> give me some food. And it worked. You know, and that was a bad situation, but what happened is, from that point on, anytime people in class got hungry, and no one would go around and I'd get a list, and my blood sugar would start to get low, and I would get escorted across the street to buy everyone food. <laughs> <laughs> There's little tricks of the trade to make it become pretty popular with diabetes. <laughs> so I told her, there's the highs, there's the lows, but what do we want from that? Good control. And at 12 years old, I found out a little trick, trick of the trade for me to get good control, and that was love. I fell in love, not with a beautiful blue-eyed girl, rather a beautiful blue two-wheeled bicycle. This bike afforded me a lot of freedoms. I like to eat, and I told, especially Snickers bars. At 12 years old, I found out the snack machine at school, and I like Snickers bars. So, what did I want to do? Did I want to do a shot and wait two hours like you had to do back then before we did food? No, I wasn't patient. I would have been a doctor, but I didn't have any patience. So I decided to go to the <laughs> So I ride my bike. So I ride my bike for 20, 30 minutes, and I had to do Snickers bars. And I ride for an hour, and I had to eat another one. <laughs> it was easy at that age for me to get a digital bike ride. So, <laughs> now we have fast track events, it's like a teacher at no blog, so you don't have to be the kid going to ride a bike to eat. But it's what, it's what I did. We always figure a way to make things happen. So I rode, and riding turned into racing. Racing became something I became very passionate about. All my friendships for years became cycling. And one of these friendships stands miles apart from the rest. And my best friend, Joe Eldridge, and I, we met. My first senior year of college at the University of Georgia at a bike race. He was racing. Right. And he was racing for, I saw someone's little belt buckle. With the, he was racing for the Auburn Tickers back then. And, but he wasn't doing very good. Joe and I had everything in life in common. We were both talking about school, bike racing, girls. Not necessarily in that order. But then we also had this other sidebar in common. So Joe had diabetes just like I did. He was the first friend that I got to be close with that had diabetes. Um, he got diagnosed at 10 years old, had excellent control through all through high school, you know, middle school years, high school, was an excellent soccer star, played varsity soccer at his school. I couldn't hit the broad side of the barn with the soccer ball, so I opted out of that. But when Joe went off to college, he kind of started letting his diabetes slip. And by the time we met, he, he was checking one, two, maybe three times a day, doing two or three shots a day, pretty much doing the bare minimum necessary to make it till tomorrow. And, you know, myself, my mother trained me very well. And I was checked, my mother and my doctors. I was checking 15, 20 times a day at that point, doing seven to 10 shots a day, make sure that I never got Lyme disease. 
it's a minor. So Joe and I got to be real close. I got to sit and watch him do this to himself. I was thinking, how can we change things up? How can we make Joe get excited about the control? He's a big guy. I don't know if you saw the pictures going through, but he was the biggest on the team. He also was very competitive. He's competitive and he likes to eat. What can we do here? Every time we got together, we check our blood sugar, we go to meals. So I figured, let's start placing bets. We did. Higher blood sugar, we pay for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> this friendship all of a sudden had a dollar value on it. Uh, for three months, I ate for free. For a college kid, they get $5 free burritos every weekend. He's hanging out with his friend. It turned out to be very good. But like I said, Joe was competitive. He got sick of losing. And decided he was going to make some changes in his life. And we now point at the A1C challenge. So after his last big loss to me, where I think he bought six meals in one weekend, he was broke at that point. He comes up with a little plan. And so what Joe did is first week he made three three changes to his diabetes control. He got rid of three bad habits. You know, missing boluses, not eating food while he was high, eating junk while he was high actually, and not exercising. The second week he started checking more. Instead of three times a day, he started checking ten to twelve times a day. Now Check it 15 pounds a day. And then what? He came back. He walked in the door. Hey, Phil, let's check. Guess what? He won. <laughs> he started big, uh, checking that much more often. He learned, started learning what worked, what didn't work. And his A1C, when we met, at a, was at 11 to last time he checked, was at 5.6. Big change. You know, and so Joe told me, at that point when he beat me the first time, which was, I think, he got me four more times and we stopped playing. <laughs> <laughs> Joe told me, you changed my life. You made me get excited about being control and realize it's just all about attitude, good attitude, then we can do anything. So we decided we want to take this and make it bigger, and we wanted to ride our bikes. So I'm a bike racer, Joe's a bike racer. And so we started, we started Team Type 1. And so we're going to form a bike team, people with diabetes, and do cool stuff. So we raised some money via selling t-shirts and did this ride to Kira out in Carmel, California. And then at that ride, we're just on 100 miles and we're toasting to a beverage. Someone said, you guys should do something big. You should ride your bikes across the country. We're both just out of college, had jobs, and thinking, that'll take forever. And not going to do that. So we said, let's race across the country. And do it with a team of people with diabetes. So within about a month after that, we had eight people with diabetes, not a single sponsor, but eight people who really wanted to be a part of this team and do something special. And as the months went by, we began to get more sponsorship. The cycling world dropped their budget down. And then I did a study with the Freestyle Navigator, thanks to Dr. Bruce Bodie in Atlanta, which said continuous glucose monitor, and realized this is what I had to have. And Dr. Bodie introduced me to Holly Cole that added diabetes care, and they agreed not only to do a study on the team during the race, but also to underwrite the whole event for us. And there we had sponsorship. So now we had to train for the race. And I started out a couple hundred miles a week, getting up to 700 miles a week. Yeah. And believe it or not, the butt was actually more sore after the 200 mile week than it was the 700. Mm -hmm. you used to it. <laughs> so we showed up at the start line. It's warm in here, isn't it? Yeah. We showed up this gym. We showed up at the start line, we're, we've just got the freestyle navigator. First year, five of us were on shots, three of us were, three people were on pumps. I was a needle junkie, I've got two doctors in the room who always ask me about pumps, but never force them on me. And that was, or maybe I never listened when they tried to, I'm not sure. But Can you introduce the two doctors to us? Larry D, took care of me for many years, and then Nancy Wright in the back. There's, there's two of the people that are responsible for me being here today, and inspiring you to do good things with the disease. And so anyway, we're at the start line. We're just now getting these machines and navigators. Continuous glucose monitor. So we start off. First day, we have no idea except where our blood sugars need to be. So you, we've never checked and raced before, so we don't know. We're clueless. We're learning as we go, though, because that's, that's diabetes. diabetes. You, you learn, you make mistakes, you have high blood sugar, you have low blood sugar, but you learn from it to try to be a little bit better next time. And so we're figuring it out. And at about a day into the race, we figured out that, hey, 140 to 180, somewhere in that range, we feel really good. But we still haven't figured out how to get it there and how to keep it there. So I want to get to a day and a half in the race, and we almost didn't make it there. 
after the first eight hour shift, and what we did the first year was eight hours on, eight hours off, eight hours on, eight hours off, the whole way across the country, with four people within that team relaying. So it's just a sprint the entire way across. So at the end of that first shift, our protocol was to do a big bolus, then drink a recovery drink, which had about 600 calories in it, then do another bolus, eat some food, go take a shower, go to sleep. So we did our bolus for, a, we for 136 grams of carbs. Our nutritionist, or a friend who's in nutri school to be a nutritionist, only put 36 grams of carbs in that bottle. Uh -oh. So we were 100 grams of carbs, over insulinized, after eight hours of extreme intense activity. <laughs> Recipe for disaster, right? Yeah. Well, it was. And we went to sleep that night. What happens after exercise like that is our blood sugars build up and they're elevated to about 200 for a couple of hours, at which point all the insulin kicks in and then so we went to sleep thinking our blisters were perfect and we were going to be all right. What would have happened if this was five years ago? I would, I'm thinking someone would pass out. There would have been severe hypo, seizure, death. But we probably wouldn't have started the race the next day. I'm standing here so we know something else happened. So we were using this to study for the continuous glucose monitor. And first we got an alarm go up, projected low. So at 75 we started eating glucose habits. And we get alarms at 60. More glucose. And then Joe and I are sleeping next to each other. Is that your alarm or is that my alarm? Is that your alarm or is that my alarm? So for that four hour session we had to sleep, we, we got a lot of six minute naps before our alarm went off. The thing is, we made it to the next morning. You know, those machines allowed us to continue the race. And like I said, technology's come a long way. So we're going to start the race the next day. And about a day later, we figured out not only where we need to be, but how to keep it there. Just so at this point in the race, we were two hours behind. And then the next 250 miles, we made up an hour. That was the power of good pollution. <laughs> it, it really does make a difference in any walk of life. And so then we keep going. As over the next thousand miles, we made up that next hour. And then from that point on, it was back and forth and back and forth with this team of professional bike racers. So here we are. This team was predicted to beat us by five hours start of the race and with two states to go we're going back and forth with them. Well, in the mountains they left us and put about 30 minutes on, to, on us in the, in the mountains they were, that's what they do they're climbers and on the home stretch and downhills and the last state which was pennsylvania kind of flat rolling hills we managed to pull almost all of it back and when all was said and done we finished three minutes behind second place set a new world record for our category and beat the second place team in our division by 24 hours but we were three minutes behind the overall win. You know, good in some regard but I'm competitive also and the fact that we were so close was kind of bittersweet. So we wanted to come back and we came back again. This time we made some changes. Jim's company, the Omnipod, they sponsored the team. Abbott, the Freestyle Flash Meter, they were the title sponsor again and as well as the Enslin Company makes a Peter Atlantis. So they came back. We have a team that was all united. We're all using the same monitors, same drugs. Our, our girl Monique Canley came from Australia this year and she switched all of her diabetes measurements over three days before the race. It was she switched her insulin, she switched her meter, she switched her pump, and she had to divide by 18 with everything she, she did to find, figure out what her glucose was because they measured new moles. Now she's divided. So, sir? You got milligrams and it's divided to get them in the most. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so we, we got, everyone got good at multiplication tables of 18. <laughs> <laughs> so we start the race again with the continuous glucose monitor. Everyone's running the phone. All with one goal to win this race. This time, from day one, from minute one, we know where our blood sugars need to be. So day and a half into the race, well, actually, 120 miles into the race. We saw that team of professional bike racers, and that was the last time we saw them. And a day and a half into the race, we're an hour and a half ahead. Three days into the race, we're two and a half hours ahead. And thanks to some crappy penalties which set us back, my fault, when all was said and done, we ended up two hours and 42 minutes ahead of this team of professional bike racers. My team of professionals with diabetes, new world record, across the country, 3,053 miles in five days, 15 hours, and 43 minutes. So again, we all have diabetes. So 
So it begins to beg the question, what else can we do? What else can we do? Thank you. Now it's, we've got all this great new technology coming out that's going to allow us to set very big goals, very high goals. One recent goal of mine is the tour. I believe in the next five years, if it's not me, there will be someone with diabetes on the tour of France. And five to seven years out, we're, our goal is to have a team of people with diabetes on the tour. So I could ask guys in the room, who's it going to be? Because we're recruiting young guys. And then a few young ladies. Yeah, I think we got one. He's in. Young ladies, Monique was pretty upset that she was the only lady on the team. So she's trying to recruit others to come ride with her. So we need a team of females out there to do it too. So, but the thing is, I think 25 years ago, my mom had to hear the words, if your son lives at 25, so I, you know, have real failure, be blind. We don't have to hear those words anymore. I'm sure there, there's people who would have had recent diagnoses. And, I just want you to know that in 25 years, your kids can be doing whatever their heart desires, whatever they want to dream of, the wildest and craziest dreams. And with good control, they can do it better than the average show. Because diabetes is learning how to manage it, how to do the day-to-day -day challenges, and overcome those and learn from them. It teaches you so much and helps you mature at such a young age. And it, it can be a blessing if you embrace the technology. Uh, help your kids to set some high goals and do the small sets that you uh, That's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyone else? What was the continuous glucose monitor that you guys were wearing in the race? Is there a freestyle navigator, which is not yet FDA approved this? Hopefully in the next few weeks, which I hope for that. It's like while. computer vaporware, though. You know, I've been saying it for three years. Yeah. So we did that uh, under an investigational protocol for the last two years. So it's not on market, but just in Europe. Supposedly, any day. So my study expires by the time it's not yet approved. I'm moving to France. Do you have that? Yes, I do. Can we see it? You know. <laughs> Right now, I'm at, my blood sugar is 119, and I'm going down. Uh, I had a 1.3 and going up, so I did a little bit of insulin, level up 145. Now I'm going back down. And where is the site that you have it? We've got one on one arm, one on the other. Behind the tricep, both locations. So it's the combination of having these two has been, has been a blessing. My OT is now 5.1. I've got 6% blood target. And it's just, it's, for me, that's my personal best. And having both these tools at my disposal to do that has allowed me to do that without fear of height. The other cool thing is the navigator's on for five days, and the Omnipod's on for three days. That's a pod type of a thing there, all of it, basically. Yeah. And so I'll, put, I'll wear the pod on one on 15 days, and we're rotating sites all around and then at the end of that 15 day period I switch arms and so that way this arm has a chance to heal so the insulin sensitivity can stay good in the arm over the duration. Well, I used to have a lot of lows with tight control but now like I said my below target is 6% so it's, it's the best for me. I would not in any way, shape, or form, and bias, trying to shoot for an A1C of five, or even you know, in the high fives, unless you have a continuous monitor. And then I would talk to your doctor, this guy right back here, so you can get a good advice. <laughs> What's your low alarm set? Uh, 65. So it's machinery that allows me to do this. The FDA approved setting for close for children. Right <coughs> yeah. I mean, that's for, for parents, when I told my mom about this, home, about the device, it was, hey, it's the first time I got, I got projected low three days in to study at 75, and then by the time I got to the bridge, which I walked the coherent pace to go get some orange juice, everything was all right. And I woke up that next morning at 80, and I told my mom, and she broke down in tears, and I'm sure the parents 
wake ups. Because I for 18 years I slept with one eye open. Yeah. For 18 years I slept with three other two wake up the next morning. That's you can set the low alarms higher. And when I'm training vigorously, you know, I would set my alarms at 80 so that I got the projected low well in advance and say it will stay perfect throughout the night. Um, any questions about the bike racing and the fastest we went down hills? <laughs> <laughs> What's the fastest you went down uh, 65 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. Coming out of Flagstaff with the tailwind. Do you guys use road bikes or mountain bikes? We had specialized uh, road bikes for the mountains and we had their time trial bikes, the Transition Pro, which we use on the flat. Yes, sir. How much did you buy for the road? My bike, my road bike weighs 17 pounds, and then my time trial bike weighs 16 and a half pounds. We got the, the lightest and the fastest wheels out, but we kind of cheated, and that we had the, the fastest technology on the bikes, the most aerodynamic helmets. It's good to know other people will tell you one. I had a diabetic friend up at MIT who told me about a research study that was done on helmets, so we have the most aerodynamic helmets on the Probably saved us nine minutes across the <laughs> and then we have the diabetes technology, which is just a good thing. Do you always wear a helmet when you ride your bike? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've got a lot of broken helmets that are good examples of why you should wear helmets. It's a must. <laughs> well, you like to ride? <laughs> so we should talk about The requirements. If you have type one, then you've already been half the battle. And that's just, you want to help people. And you can help people get excited about the control and the technology that we can use to have it. That's, I've been fortunate to have eight teammates that have made a lot of sacrifices you know, to be a part of the team and make sure that we showed up in top shape so we could not only compete but win. So I've got, my, I've got contact information up here, so if you all have questions about the Omnipod, which we all use this year, I'd be happy to answer those offline or here for that night. Um, since, you know, nutrition is a major part of cycling for all the cyclists, right? did you find that because you guys were so in tune to uh, what, what you had to do to take care of yourselves uh, on a regular basis, are you guys better prepared for those kind of endurance events because of that? We've always got it in the back of our head. And so that's, when I'm racing with my teammates now, whenever we ride by each other, hey, need to eat, need to eat. And so we're, we're on average fueling our bodies probably 90% better than the, the average Joe out there. And it's cycling, it's every little percent, as you think you know, you ride, right? Every little percent matters. And so you can have a system set up where boom, 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 boom. Yeah, you're just be much better off than the other. And I saw a recent study of some non-diabetics who wore the continuance. And one lady who was a little bit out of shape, hers went up, her blood sugar went up to 200 during the ride. And then the guys that were in good shape, they were they stayed mostly between 140 and 180 throughout the duration of the ride. And you know that's what we felt best too. So yeah, yes. Jim, Chris? Yeah, copies of that. Yeah. We'll have the site of the race and stuff. Uh, we'll have to check on that. Can you just check my dollars? We might. I think we'll be putting something similar to this up on the website in probably the next couple of weeks. Probably on YouTube. I've seen it. That's no active pod. <laughs> Mine expires in a couple of hours, so. What do you use for nutrition? Do you use your typical gels, OMGs, Snicker Bar? Well, we used a lot of gels and bagel sandwiches, granola bars, Snicker Bars, and then a lot of EAS stuff for when we were off the bike. So how often do you find yourself eating this brand typical racing game? We were eating on average seven to nine hundred grams of carbs over the, a day during the race across America. And so it was whenever we were getting off the bike, we were eating food. And you, know, you think insulin? So the first, the cool thing was the insulin. 
And over the first two days, our insulin requirements dropped drastically. And then they bottomed out. I think you might be able to explain physiology. But we started burning a lot of fat out there. And our insulin requirements actually started going back up. By the end of the race, I was doing more insulin than the first day. I've lost And it's actually interesting. People who are competitive will find that the next day, after they have been on a big event like that, the insulin doses keep going up. Okay, well, we were so well controlled during the race, and then two days later, after no one had ridden, it was just, we were all using triple the amount of that's like, yeah, <laughs> pull us, pull us, pull us. So, it was pretty much eating non stop. How long was the race? 3,000 miles. Five days, 15 hours, 43 minutes. <laughs> we were taking two seconds. So, Jim, did you have anything else? Uh, I think we're pretty much we pretty much covered the bases. If anyone has any final questions about anything, certainly ask. Don't forget, there's a packet outside you can take with you on the table, as well as a uh, replica of the uh, the Army Quad. Question. Um, yeah. Will the um, handheld device tell you how much insulin on there? Yes. Yes. Also has an insulin reservoir to let you know when you get down to a certain, it has a gas tank built inside here, so when you get down to like uh, 10 or 20 uh, right. units, they, they calculate insulin on there. Yes. Yeah, there's a low reservoir, there's also a uh, user definable uh, expiration reminder. One to 18 hours in advance. Uh, there's a 71 hour reminder and continuous 72 hour reminder. Are there carrying devices for it? Or uh, it comes with a belt clip. I, I, there's a pouch that comes with it. There's also a belt clip that comes with it as well, too. Well, the, I guess the cool thing about this is you have the, the brain, big brain, and then your meter and your strips. That's all you have to take. And I think for up until I was, I got the Omnibot, I was carrying this bag which had my Atlantis, my Pedro, you know, a million needles, strips, cricketer, and so it just, it simplifies it in a lot more than just having a pump on it. So I, as you can see, if I didn't have an aviator, this is what I would have, my PDM strips and cricketer in my pocket, and, and had it for a year and a half, or since July of last year, and I haven't knocked on the wood. I haven't left it. Oh, yeah. so I always carry my needle. You can lock the buttons. Uh, so in case anything's accidentally pressed, it's not going to affect uh, No one button can either suspend insulin delivery or deliver a bolt. So you have to go through a couple of different button impressions to actually get to the screen. That would be bad. So if any of the buttons get smushed in his pants, it's not going to affect his insulin. It's not like you're pocket dialing with your cell phone, which I did twice today. Now with the insulin puppy, you kind of have to worry about the insulin being hot. Uh, what about this? We, we started off in California, San Diego, and about 75. Very nice. And then six to eight hours later, we were in the desert of Arizona, 150 oh. degrees. We had an eight hour stretch where in and out of the car was, about, on average, was an average of 107 that day. And then our next shift was. Colorado was 34 degrees. Basically what happens is, the whole time. we've actually done research into that where we've actually sampled insulin out of the pod. What happens because the pod, unlike a, a conventional pod, which is down here, the pod is actually on the skin, on, on the body itself. So the actual uh, evaporation and perspiration, the natural cooling of the skin, remains very consistent to the temperature of the skin. Um, and our, our internal research has demonstrated that it's a it's very consistently healthy temperature. It's exactly it doesn't, the outside temperature, if it's hot, I don't, really mean, I don't, I don't after recommend after. people sunbathe with it on. Let's put it down. <laughs> but like yeah. he was in the yeah. I mean, what, yeah, because his, his, his body's naturally cooling, cooling, his body's naturally cooling itself, it cools the insulin and pot. That's on, similar to that, I've done you know, five, six hour races where it's 105 degrees outside the entire time with the sun baking out on it. Everything's okay. Yeah. I mean, we're not saying you can't go to the beach. We have uh, a lot of ladies still put it on the bottom part of their, their low part of their bathing suit underneath, you know, uh, and be fully covered there. We've had people exposing themselves. 
being exposed right on here and being in the water and so was really no issue. So um, I had a call uh, just the other day, a gentleman bought a new house, had a hot tub. He's really concerned about, you know, can I go in the hot tub with this? Well, you can, but the hot tub location is you know behind the tricep and just kinda of keep the arm up probably outside of the water, you know. So you can go in the hot tub, you don't have to really disconnect it because you'd be wearing it on that side. So it would involve a little planning if you regularly wear it down here. And obviously, you'd have to have it up there for that. With the heat, maybe take it off, maybe it peel off. It's easier if you were on a hot tub. Would it peel off easier? Like, like from the heat, from the you know being in a hot tub. Well, we we don't we don't want to. Um, we just don't to answer your question. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. It would it would make the adhesive softer, whether or not. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. You want it again too. I mean that's an extreme okay. situation. Yeah. yeah. You just said it sticks. So I'm sure. You don't want to compromise the insulin on the insulin underneath the water at that temperature. Okay. So I think we get up to like 107 degrees. Yeah. It's pretty warm that's, that's for a hot tub. Okay. Had a question. Um, no question. When you guys were racing, did you carry your your the monitor for your blood sugar monitor and the monitor for the, for the pot on you at all times? Or now, we would carry the blood sugar monitor with us, but we, we had a crappy little set up on our handlebars. Okay, so, so we would leave the, 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 pump, the PDM in the car. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit of a problem. Yeah, when I train, I take it with me because I've got I've figured out different basal requirements for different training periods for. I'm training for two hours versus six hours. There's different things I have to do near the end of the ride, so that close ride I can eat the right amount of food and cover. So I do take it with me on every train ride. I'm not racing. Is, um, is there any uh, likelihood that either subsequent generations of the pod might be smaller in size or that? The one that contains the um, the sensor is going to be larger. Well, you know, anything's possible. We really there's yeah. no timeline on either of those things at present. So and, yeah, and engineering has stated openly that the pods can be. We can actually design the pod to be twenty percent smaller. Yeah. But right right now, again, too, this is uh, we're, we're looking at more evolutionary changes to the pods. Um, maintaining good quality control on the production line from the factory uh, before we go ahead and we change the size on this. I think you'll probably see a change in this. This will be a compound this thick with a color screen, you know, um, on the next generation. But uh, for right now, it's just, this is actually cosmetic like related issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? A little different uh, way of delivering insulin, managing your insulin? Our uh, website is on the uh, packet out there. It's myomnipod.com, myomnipod.com. So the website is on all of the literature. Certainly check that out. Yeah. Are there cost listed in there that y'all are um, No, they are Probably not. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, probably shield has, yeah, we've had more of a success.